Those verses are just, they're, to me, they're just unbelievable. You know, they're just unbelievable how, you know, they're so paramount. I mean, here Moses tells the children of Israel, you know, God's children, God's firstborn, Israel, his wife. This is, this is the most important thing. And then, you know, Yeshua, who is the king of Israel, although obviously the church sees him as, as Jesus the Christ, right? But nevertheless, they ask him, what's the most important thing? And he says the exact same thing. So old, new, Bible, this is, you can't get away from it. You just can't get away from it. And, and because of that, um, I, can't, I can't give it what I think it deserves in one Shabbat. So we're going to talk about this probably for the month of August, if you don't mind. Um, you know, if, if God uh, changes things, that's kind of what he led me to believe. But if he's more than, he, you know, he, I'm more than willing to, to defer. Um, but it looks like we're going to go in this direction, okay? Um, I want to I wanna read something to you, if I may. Something from, uh, if I read it, you're going to think it was written yesterday, but it was written in the mid-1800s by a guy. His name was Macintosh, and it's, um, if you want to follow, he wrote notes on the Pentateuch, which is Greek for the first five books. So he wrote this, you know, very long commentary, and this is from page 895. No, I have not read it. And if you look him up, you might say, wait a minute, there's some things that I don't agree with about him. I'm not saying I agree with everything he's ever written. I'm saying I agree with what I'm going to read to you. You follow? There's no way I agree with every theologian, everything they said, and there's no way they would agree with me. There's no way I would agree with you on everything. There's no way you're going to agree with me on everything. And you have to realize today there's so much information on the Internet that people's theology is... Although they seem to be interesting, they're dangerous. You're getting away from the simplicity of the gospel of the kingdom and who we're supposed to be in that kingdom. And you're getting involved in genealogies and you're getting involved in myths. Don't waste your time with that. Don't waste your time with extra biblical information. It could be detrimental to your walk. Stick with the book. Um, I'll quote from C.H. McIntosh. It says, The word of God is not loved and studied, either privately or publicly. Thousands will flock to hear music and pay for admission, but how few care for a meeting to read the Holy Scriptures. These are facts, and facts are powerful arguments. We cannot get over them. There is a growing thirst for religious excitement and a growing distaste for the calm study of Holy Scripture and the scriptural exercises of the Christian assembly. It is perfectly useless to deny it. We cannot shut our eyes to it. The evidence of it meets us on every hand. Thank God there are a few here and there who really love the word of God and delight to meet in holy fellowship for the study of his precious truths. May the Lord increase the number of such and bless them till traveling days are done. 1850, wow. almost 100 years ago. And if you think it's getting any better, you're crazy. So, so what's the message? To worry about how bad it's getting and how the church is, is getting secularized and the world is getting in? No, stand for what you believe, for God's sakes. Stand up for what you believe. Don't deny what you believe. You don't have to be ugly about it, but you're called to be salt and light. If there's no salt, nothing gets preserved and purified. If there's no light, the world lives in darkness. You follow? Stand up for what you believe. Um, also, um, I got a call from the, the, the uh, tour company um, that we've been using for the last 15 years, uh, Educational Opportunities, and it appears that a lot of people that listen online have been calling and saying, is, is there going to be another trip out of Beth Yeshua? So, you know, after careful prayer, the answer is yes. Um, we're going to go April 2018. The issue is um, it's very busy there now. And um, it's very hard to get the hotels and the places that I kind of feel are, are, are most beneficial for our trip and our people. So it looks like it's going to be April 18th. I'll have probably the brochures printed from the tour operator this week. But if you do want to go, I'm, I'm not trying to be... 
a salesman. I could care less. This wasn't even my idea. I really didn't, wasn't sure I wanted to go this year. But with that being said, space is limited because space in the hotel is limited and space in the bus is limited. So if you're really planning on going, don't, don't hem and whore because it will, be, it will be too late. It will fill up probably fairly quickly, I would, I would presume, um, if, if I have it correct. So we'll get the brochures out. You can, you can sign up online or you can call them if you're not good with the computer like I'm not. You can call Educational Opportunities to get signed up, no problem. We'll get all that information out to you uh, within probably a week. Now, let's look at the scripture that Michael, a.k.a. Mick, read so eloquently. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 6. It says, and all we're going to do today is lay a foundation. We're not even going to get into Matthew 22 because this is too rich and too huge to just gloss over, if you ask me. It says, Shema Yisroel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. The English here, Israel, Adonai our God, Adonai is one. And you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart, all your being, all your resources. Sometimes you'll see the word soul for being. These words, which I am ordering you today, are to be on your heart. Um, next week, we're probably going to delve into that. This is just the foundation. I want you to understand this from a Jewish perspective. If you consider yourself a Christian, there's nothing wrong with that. There's everything right about that to call yourselves a follower of Jesus Christ. You are a Judeo-Christian. You have to understand that. You, you, a person can be, can be Jew Jewish, you know. A person can be traditionally Jewish and, and stop in the Old Testament. But it's really impossible to be a Christian and not go back into the o Old Testament. It just is. You know, you're a Bible believer. You're not a New Testament believer. You can say, I believe in the New Testament, so do I, but I would never call myself a New Testament believer. In reality, you're not a New Testament believer. You're in a covenant with God. You're a new covenant believer. And you might say, well, you're being, you know, you're, you're really being nitpicky. I am really not being nitpicky. God is very careful with his words. And Satan is very good with confusing words. That's why I said, did God really say? So I'm telling you, know what you believe. Because if you don't know what you believe, how are your kids going to know what they believe? Amen. Most people can't even articulate their faith. They could talk about a dinner for hours. Every nuance of each herb that went into the cooking process. But when you ask them about their faith, they really can't articulate it. They're not sure what they believe. And your creed produces your character, not the opposite. Whatever you believe produces who you'll become. So it's, it's crucial, just absolutely crucial. Now, although Judaism has no catechism, any recovering Catholics here? Okay, you know about the catechism, right? A catechism is just a summary of religious principles. There's nothing wrong with it. Most denominations have a summary of their religious principles, which is important, okay? Judaism has no catechism. It doesn't. But the Shema would be the closest to being Judaism's credo or their formula of belief. Right there. I mean, guys, six Hebrew words. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Six Hebrew words sums up Judaism's belief in monotheism and the rejection of all idols. You see how powerful that to me? It's so powerful because, to be honest with you, monotheism is one of the three greatest gifts that the Jewish people gave to the religious community. Prior to this, prior to this, the world was polytheistic. And the world in many ways is still polytheistic. The body of Messiah. The other two gifts, of course, are what? The Word of God. It says in Romans 3, 2, because there's this argument that Paul's having with himself just for teaching purposes to the Gentile believers, Rome. And he's saying, so, so who's a Jew? You can't just be a Jew because your last name is Hirschberg. That doesn't cut it. That just makes you biologically Jewish. But a praiser of God, who is it? It's one who has their heart circumcised, not the foreskin circumcised. Their heart is circumcised. And then so he, he goes... Because, you know, the arrogant is going to say, so there's no point in being Jewish, right? Who cares that you're Jewish? Who cares that your kids are Jewish, Rabbi? Just be a Christian. He goes, oh, no, it's very important. He says, for they were entrusted with the oracles of God. Do you realize, sir, 
you would not be able to read your Bible if it wasn't for the Jewish people. Do you know how many of them gave their life to preserve the Word of God? And the third thing they gave us is the Messiah, Yeshua. When he was speaking to the Samaritan, he said out of his own words, look, you, you, you don't know what you're worshiping. You have your own system. We do know what we're worshiping, for salvation is of the Jews. I know it sounds arrogant, and you might not be a Jew lover, but the fact of the matter is if you're blood-bought, you'd be crazy not to be because they gave you monotheism, they gave you the Bible, and they gave you Yeshua. And guess what? Yeshua is crazy about them, and the reason why he's coming back besides to set up his kingdom is to fight against her enemies. So can you imagine being in love with Jesus and not being in love with what he's in love with? Do you know how cockamamie that is? Rabbi, how could that happen? Satan is incredible at what he does. Incredible. And if there's anything Yeshua is anti, it's anti-Semitism. To this very present day, guys, observant Jews, and when I say observant, I'm talking about the ultra-Orthodox community. Judaism is mostly secularized, just, just like a lot of Christianity is secularized now. You know, there's only a, a, a very small portion of truly observant Jews who are trying to be religious. And I don't use that word like some of you might use it as a religious spirit. Religious, religious from the, from the Latin means to bind with God. They're trying to connect very, very diligently with God. Observant Jews will recite the Shema four times a day. Okay. Twice during the morning prayers, as soon as they wake up, it's called shacharit. Maybe some of you know it. It comes from the Hebrew word shacha, which means morning light. The first thing you do, do you realize that wherever you are, someplace the sun is always shining? The sun is always shining somewhere. So somebody's, you know, proclaiming the light of God. For Jewish, for observant Jewish people, first thing in the morning, before they do anything, you'll see when you take the plane, if you take the plane with me, over there. You'll see them as soon as they wake up and it's morning time, they go between the cabins and start praying. Throw their talits on and start praying. And they have to say the Shema twice. Once also during evening prayer, which is called Ma'ariv, which is from the Hebrew word nightfall of bringing on the night. So they say twice in the morning, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad, and a bunch of other prayers, once at night. And then they have to say it right before they go to sleep. Just an example, the Shema is the central part of all the prayers. In the morning, there are 15 different prayers that the Jewish people say. Traditional, beautiful prayers. I'll give you an idea of one evening prayer. This is absolutely beautiful, okay? This is what they say, one of them, just one of them. Praise to you, Adonai, our God, ruler of the universe, who closes my eyes in sleep, my eyelids in slumber. May it be your will, Adonai, my God, and the God of my ancestors, to lie me down in peace and then to raise me up in peace. Let no disturbing thoughts upset me, no evil dreams nor troubling fantasies. May my bed be complete and whole in your sight. Grant me light so I do not sleep the sleep of death, for it is you who illumines and enlightens. Praise to you, Adonai, whose majesty gives light to the universe. Now you might say that's religious. What do you say before you go to bed? <sighs> That's impressive. Sure, God gets a kick out of that. I think we can learn from a lot of different religions. And I think there is this Christian arrogance because we have Jesus and we're going to heaven. I got news for you. There are a lot of Christians I meet. I have secular friends who do way more for people than most Christians I know. That's a sad fact. We're too busy eating hot dogs and watching ball games and having our little Bible fellowships with our friends. And they're at the homeless shelter. And they're wondering, wow, is that really what Jesus was about? I think some of these prayers are beautiful. I'm not telling you you should say them, but it would be nice if you prayed to the Lord before you went to bed. It would be nice if you prayed when you woke up. Just an idea. I'm not, I don't want any guilt trip on you. Knock yourself out. If this is working for you, Keep, keep doing what you're doing. But I think it's quite beautiful. I really do. For 2,000 years, the Shema has been the verse 
with which many Jewish martyrs have gone to their deaths. Anybody familiar with Rabbi Akiva? You might not be. I mean, you're not going to, obviously, you're not going to hear it at, you know, First Baptist. But the point is, and there's no reason why you should. Don't, don't get me wrong. There's no reason why you should, per se. But with that being said, Rabbi Akiva is probably one of the most famous rabbis in Judaism besides Hillel, who taught Gamaliel. Rabbi Akiva was a very, very humble man, incredibly humble. And he was incredibly benevolent. He was illiterate for a very long time. And he would almost, he couldn't understand how some of these ecclesiastical brilliant theologians were, were, were the claim to fame. Because he was all about being humble and giving to others. He managed to have 24,000 students. And he also went away from his home for 24 years to study Torah. And when they study Torah, they do it every day for 10 to 12 hours a day. I know 24 years of it. And at his son's funeral, he said, you know, when this big crowd came out, Simeon, when he died, he said, you're not here because I'm a scholar, because I'm really not. <laughs> you're here because you're honoring God and you're honoring the Torah. And that's why you're paying respects to my son. He was really, I'm, I mean to tell you, the guy was incredibly humble. But like a lot of people in the second century, you know, he was the sage of sage. He thought that Bar Chochba, Simon Bar Chochba, if you're familiar, 135 AD, CE, whatever you like, that he was the Messiah. And he led a rebellion. And because he, you know, went behind him, he was pronounced to die a martyr's death. This is um, incredible, though. He, he's being tortured to death by the Romans for his support, right? And he was probably the most famous of all martyrs. This is what it says in the Talmud Brachot 9.5. It says, when Akiva, Rabbi Akiva, was being tortured, the hour for saying the morning Shema arrived. So right first thing in the morning, they're going to start to torture him, and it's his time to say the morning. Who would think about saying the Shema while they're being tortured? He said it and smiled. The Roman officer called out, quote, old man, are you a sorcerer? That you smile in the middle of your pains? Because there were legitimate sorcerers around and they're still around. No, replied Akiva, but all my life when I said the words, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your means, I was saddened for I thought, when shall I be able to fulfill this command? I have loved God with all my heart and with all my means, but to love him with all my soul, my life itself, I did not know I could carry it out. Now that I'm giving my life and the hour for reciting the Shema has come and my resolution remains firm, should I not smile? Guys, I realize it's convicting because he didn't know Jesus. We lose it when we get a flat tire. God, I have a nail appointment. I didn't need this now. This guy's being tortured and he's smiling. You know, it's funny. I'm making it funny, but listen, it's very sad. Yes. It's a sad state of affairs when the air conditioning goes off in the church and people are flipping out because there's a bead of sweat. I'm here to tell you, I know, I know I shouldn't be so convicting. Just live and let live. Guys, if our hour of testing will come in our lifetime, live and let live won't cut it. The Shema is the most famous of all Jewish sayings. It is a declaration of faith and a pledge of allegiance to the one true God. It is said upon rising in the morning and upon going to sleep at night. It is said when praising God and when beseeching God. It is the first prayer that a Jewish child is taught to say. And it is the very last words a Jew says prior to death. I want to focus on the fact that it's the first prayer that a Jewish child is taught to say. Are you guys familiar with the rabbi Eliezer Silver? I have a, I have a pastor friend that knew about him. Um, he, he was... Um, president of the conservative rabbis in America, and he was also president of something called Va'ad Hatzalah, which is the rescue committee. Because after World War II, there were many Jewish children that were stuck in, in places of non-Jewish families, but they had no paperwork. 
And this guy thought it would only be right to rescue them and bring them to the States and raise them in a Jewish family, right? Makes sense. To preserve the line. So in 1945, Rabbi Eliezer Silver was sent to Europe to help reclaim Jewish children who had been hiding or hidden during the Holocaust with non-Jewish families. How was he able to discover the Jewish children? He would go to the gatherings of the children and loudly proclaim, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Then he would look at the faces of the children for those with tears in their eyes. Those children whose distant memory of being Jewish was their mothers putting them to bed each night and saying the Shema with them. The Torah even records Moses including the Shema in his farewell address to the Jewish people. Look at Deuteronomy 11 with me. He says, you are to love Adonai your God and always obey his commission. Regulations, rulings. If you're reading the complete Jewish, it would say mitzvot. Mitzvot is just commandments. And in Judaism, like if I do something nice for Havah, she goes, oh, Rabbi, what a mitzvah it comes from. Because we're commanded. We're actually commanded to love the poor, the widow, and the orphan. It's a sad state of affairs when we have to be commanded. Because if truly your heart is circumcised and it's soft, how could you walk by? Love doesn't look away, does it? And I get it. You have your own families. You have to take care of them. But if you make two columns and you put on one side of the column what you do for yourself and your family and on the other side it's empty, something's really out of whack. It's really off balance. I understand they get the first fruits. I get it. I'm, I'm a father. But if all I'm doing is for them, what am I telling them? So, of course, we're in Deuteronomy. The 11 day journey to Kaddish Barnea took 38 years, a little long. And 603,550 fighting men that came out, 603,548 of them lost their lives in the wilderness. And now he's talking to those who, who survived. And he's telling them in Deuteronomy 1, 2, and 3, and 4 about the highlights and the lowlights. It's important to understand your past, see where you went wrong. Now he's saying, you're going into the land, okay? Let's do this thing right so we have a beautiful future. And at different times, this is one time, he's kind of reciting the Shema to them. He says, you ought to love. Hero is Shema. You ought to love Adonai, your God. And always obey his commission, his regulations, his rulings and commandments. Therefore, you ought to store up these words of mine in your heart. Read them. Read them. Marinate in them. Get them in you. You ought to store up these words of mine in your heart and in your being, in your soul, your decision maker, the seat of your emotions. Tie them. Now, the Jewish people tie them, but it's not literal, but it's okay. It's like a WWJD bracelet, whatever works for you. But he's saying tie them on your hand as a sign. He's, he's, he's talking about the hand is your action. Let them be your actions. Put them as on the front of a headband around your forehead. Dwell upon them. Think about them. Keep them on the forefront of your thoughts. And then he says, teach them carefully. Not just teach them. Be very diligent about teaching your children. Talk about them when you sit in the home. How many people sit in the home and never talk to their kids about the Lord? How many people never ask their child, what do you believe, son? Then they go off to college and they don't understand. My kid's basically like agnostic now. How did that happen? He went to church every Wednesday and Sunday. Yeshua didn't say go to church. He said come to me. And it's not the pastor who's going to teach your kids. I would never, ever let my kids be taught by a pastor. They'd be taught by their father. You follow? I'm teaching you how to be a pastor, pal. You're the pastor. Okay, you're with them 24-7. I'm with them for an hour and a half. I will encourage you, and I will help teach you to teach them, but I am not their father. That's your responsibility. Carefully teach your children, talking about them when you sit at home, 
Talk about them when you travel on the road. Talk about them when you're getting ready for bed, lying down. Talk about them when you get up. And don't do it religiously. I'm, please don't. They won't receive it. I'll get into that in a minute. Write them on the door frames of your house and on your gates, right? Mezuzot, the mezuzah. It's, it means door frame. So they took it literal, and they took these scriptures, and they put them inside this little casing, and they put them on the door. It's okay. It's all right. Does that mean they're going to obey God? No, no more than the cross around your neck means you're going to obey God. No more than coming here means you're going to obey God. No more than reading the Bible means you're going to obey God. No more than praying means you're going to obey God. But there's nothing wrong with that if it's symbolic of something you're doing. Do you know that that thing was an amulet to me? Do you know when I used to walk to school in the Bronx, when I would get to school and realize that I didn't kiss the mezuzah, I thought I was going to lose my life. I ran all the way back home to kiss it. To this day, I still kiss the mezuzah when I leave the house. It's just something. Now, was I obeying God? No. No, but I thought there was power in that. There's no power in that cross. There's no power. The power is in the one who was on the cross. So he's, he's, he's beseeching them. He's telling them, this is important for you. It's not for him. He's God. He gets it. He knows who he is. He's very confident in who he is. This is not, if you look at Deuteronomy 10, he says, if you do these things, it will be good for you and your life. This isn't your, the only reason you're making him happy is because he wants you to have a good, he wants to bless you. He doesn't want you to hurt any more than you need to. But this is, it's, it's not for him. He didn't set these things up for him. He set these things up for you and me. Now, like any good doctor, a doctor will sit down and, and give you some tests, right, and say, okay, based on your numbers, this is what you need to do. They'll give you some kind of prognosis and give you a, a protocol. If they're really wise and they're not arrogant, they'll also tell you what will the ramifications if you don't. Very important to tell people the ramifications. It's important for you to say, hey, doc, what if I don't? He needs to tell you. He, you shouldn't even have to ask. And the only way he won't tell you is if his waiting room has a lot of people in it. Sorry. So look at the next couple of verses. I just threw these in, just a couple. It says, For if you will take care to obey all these commandments I am giving you, to do them, to love Adonai your God and to follow all his ways and to cling to him, then Adonai will expel these nations ahead of you and you will dispossess nations bigger and stronger than you are. If you go home and you continue to read, he's going to tell you what's going to happen if you don't. You're not in the dark with the Lord. So here Moses is basically saying, understand your past. Don't dwell on it. it. What is the point of laying down your bed and going, oh, if I would have only... My dad hated the word if. If you used it. And he had a saying that I cannot share here with you. If this congregation was in the Bronx, it would be a no-brainer. But because this congregation is in Macon, where, you know, dung is the worst word we'll use. Because, see, we think in the culture here that if you say a curse, it's really, really bad. But you're free to gossip. Check your Bible and see what God has a bigger problem with. But yeah, he would say, what do you say, son? <laughs> so understand your past. Don't dwell. Look at the highlights. Look at the lowlights. Learn, learn from it. Learn from your past. But come to the realization that the choices you make today are going to dictate your tomorrow. Just think about it. That's all I'm saying. Don't be paranoid. Don't be worried. Just think. 
about it because you, no man's an island and you're affecting the whole universe. Now, I just want to highlight one word, this word cling. It's Dobach. And if you know the Velcro company, which has made billions of dollars, they're privately owned, by the way. They figured this thing out back in 1950. It's not something new. And you know how it sticks. This is, this is what God is asking of us. You know, I played, I, didn't, I played a lot of basketball and a lot of football. And, and when I was young in the Bronx, um, if, if I was guarding you man on man, if it was man to man defense, you weren't getting to the basket. And if, I was, if you came off the line and I was, I was a cornerback and my assignment was just you, you weren't getting the ball. Because I could so focus on that. But when they tried to implement this 1-3-1 in the zone business, I was totally confused. I couldn't handle it because I was ADD, so I, could, I was like, what's going on? <laughs> Who do I guard? And I couldn't handle it. So when I had my first child, Jeremy, I was, it was unbelievable. I was so good at it because I was playing man-to-man. And then they came along. And they flooded my zone, and I still don't know what to do. <laughs> Anybody know what I'm talking about? In fact, I was sitting down with them. I'll tell you something funny. I was sitting down with them the other day <laughs> that was laughing in the kitchen. I was sitting down, and um, I was telling them, look, you know, your dad cursed heavily when I was young. In the Bronx, it's part of the lingo. It's just part of it. And I don't know if you've ever seen, but there's some things that just can't be expressed without the right words. I'm just throwing that out. You know what I'm talking about, anybody? There's sometimes where you're like, no, that word's not good. Dung's not going to cut it. Oh, dung. But anyway, that's, I'm, 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 I'm saying sometimes, you know, when you, when you curse, it shows ignorance, even though some of these guys on Wall Street make it a couple of hundred, couple of hundred million dollars a year. They're Harvard grads, and they're, and they're dropping the F-bomb in every sentence. But that was, I, I did that a lot. When I, when I met the Lord, I just... He took a lot of things. He really dealt with a lot of things. And I stopped cursing. Now, Jeremy was born 1994. Shana was born 99. Max, 2001. And Lily, 2005. So I'm sitting down with them. And I'm saying, every now and then you hear your father curse. I'm not proud of it. I'm not. But if you knew how much I used to curse, you'd be like, I've made some great improvement, right? <laughs> but this is what I told them. They didn't get it till the third, I think. But I said, oh, you got it right away? Okay. <laughs> you did? Oh, all right, I didn't say you were stupid. I didn't, you didn't act like you got it. Oh, you didn't want to let me know you got it. I got it. So I said, well, I stopped cursing in 89, but then I started picking it up again in about 94. Then 99, I started to curse a little bit more. 2001, it was really bad. Then by 2005, it was flagrant. But I didn't think you got it. You got it right away? All right. Good for you. Yeah, they know me. They know me. But what I'm saying... If, if sometimes I think, I don't think, I know, this multitasking is not working. Everybody does it now, but it doesn't work. And I'll tell you why it doesn't work. Science proves that you can only have one thought at one time. And you can't do two things well at once. Now, we've learned how to, but I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot more car accidents these days. Look at the statistics, okay? So some of us will be listening to music with the TV on, talking on the phone, and texting. Do you think anybody can really have your undivided attention that way? It doesn't work, guys. You might, you might think it is working for you. It's not working for you. Okay, it's just not working. And if you try to implement a lot of things at one time, God's not going to get your undivided attention. Listen to me, sweet pea. He deserves your undivided attention. When you talk to him, you want to be an only child, right? You want your one-on-one -on -one time with God. Why can't he get it from you except when you need something? Is it even fair? From a human perspective, forget about spirituality for a minute. Is that really fair, that kind of relationship? To not give him your undivided attention? So stop playing zone and play man-to-man. Focus on one thing. When you spend time with God, even if it's 10 minutes, let it be undivided. You will get so much more out of your relationship. Okay? And this is what he's asking. Stay close to me. Cling to me. 
Now, we recite the Shema on Shabbat. We recite the Shema at festivals. The Shema is contained in the mezuzah. We affix to the doorpost of our homes. And the extended Shema is the very essence of Judaism. To love God, to learn Torah, and to teach our children. Look at it for a second. We'll be closing momentarily. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7. I just want to lay this foundation for you. And then next week we're going to delve into this harder. And then we're going to delve into what Yeshua taught in Matthew 22. And we're going to get into that other part of the command. Leviticus 19, 18. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 7, it says, Shema Yisroel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear Israel, Adonai our God, Adonai is one, and we'll get into that one next week. And you are to love Adonai your God before your heart, all your being and all your resources. I just want you to know, even though this is coming from a Jewish perspective, this has not changed for the new covenant believer. We're still supposed to love God with all our heart, with all our soul and with all our might and resources. These words which I am ordering you today, not suggesting, ordering you today, are to be on your heart. And you are to teach them carefully to your children. You are to talk about them when you sit at home, when you are traveling on the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. Let's look at the first part of this for a sec. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. And you are to love Adonai your God with all your heart and with all your being and with all your resources. It's a command to love God, but we know that our whole faith is about loving God. Yes. It's, it's, that's the essence. But how do we love God? We don't love God by singing songs, although that's part of it. We don't love God by Bible studies, although that's part of it. We don't love God through prayer, although that's part of it. But that's not the essence of loving God. Yeshua taught us. He said, if you love me, you would... I know this isn't popular talk. Some of you old folk, it is. You've heard it all your life. But today in church, it's not popular. You know? It's not about obeying him. It's about... And you know, even I have to check myself all the time, guys. Why am I going to India? Am I going to India to tell a story? Am I going to India for Greg's glory? Why am I doing this? God, if I'm doing it for my glory, if I'm doing it to tell a story, if I'm doing it to feel good about myself, if I'm doing it to show off, it's a mistake. If I'm not doing it for your glory, it's a mistake. I have to check myself all the time. I have to constantly ask God, what is the motivation of my heart? Because I don't always understand it. And if I don't understand the motivations of my heart, I'm here to maybe say, maybe you don't understand the motivations of yours. Maybe, just maybe. And you have to ask God because he's the only one. And I got news for you. Don't try to understand the motivations of another person's heart when you can't even understand the motivations of your own. That's between them and God, but it's your responsibility to get with God and say, what is motivating me right now, Father? What is really motivating me? Nobody loves God with all their heart. Nobody. I know that hurts some of you, but you don't. God's saying that you should love him with all your heart all the time. There's not one person in the sanctuary who does that. But it is wise to get with God and say, how much do I love you? What are we talking about here? The only way to show God that you love him is by doing what he says. I used to ask my mom all the time when I was young, what do you want for Mother's Day? She'd say, just obey me, Greg. Everybody in the neighborhood tells me how much you love me. Just, I don't want to hear it from them. Show me. She never wanted to hear it. Don't tell me you love me. My mother would say, not interested. Show me. Show me. She said all the time, what do you want, Mom? No, I don't want a little ashtray that you made out of a shell. I don't, you want to make that, that's great. But that's not what I'm looking for, son. I'm not looking for a gift once a year. I'm looking for respect the whole year. And she was absolutely deserving of it. She was absolutely correct in her assessment of what a parent wants. And if a parent wants that, how much more should God want that and deserve it? So love God. Next, Deuteronomy 6.6. 6, These words which I'm ordering you today to be on your heart. Look, I, I, my kids are going to hear something. They're going to be like, how many times are you going to tell us this? Well, you have to marinate yourself in the word of God. Yes. Guys, not 
to learn for prowess or not to learn so that when you get into a spiritual joust with somebody, when they say something, you go, well, what I find, you're just arguing. You're just arguing. This, you know, if somebody shares something with you and they have a good heart and they're sharing something that they read and it means a lot to them, let them have it. You don't have to go, yeah, but what, the way I see it, stop it. Let them have it. The Word of God is blessing them. Every word in the Word of God will bless you. But you got to get in it. And so few are. There are so many people here that have not opened up their Bible all week. All week. When I lived alone, which was for a good while, not that good of a while, what was it, five years about? I, I had a cook. Now, anybody can make breakfast, right? And, and lunch is easy, but I, 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 I would learn how to make dinner, and I got, I got this, um, it was like a foreman-type grill. Remember those? Yeah. You know, easy, right? Easy, easy. And, and chicken was my go-to meat because I wasn't eating red meat. And, and fish, you know, there wasn't any really great fish stores around, you know. So, so chicken. Chicken's easy, right? And so somebody told me that if you marinate the chicken in Italian dressing for like 24 hours, it comes out super juicy. See, the thing is, I don't like Italian dressing. But I didn't put two and two together. So I put it in the fridge overnight, came back from work the next night, 24 hours, and I cooked it, and I just couldn't stand the flavor. Just hated the flavor. So what do you do to kill flavor on a chicken? Barbecue sauce. So I went out and got some barbecue sauce because, you know, I was raised by a guy who was raised during the Depression. You don't throw anything out. You just, we don't throw anything out in our house. We'll fix it some way, but no food goes in the garbage in the Hirschberg household. You don't scrape nothing off your plate. Mm -mm, no way. So, so I got the barbecue sauce, but you know what? When I doused it in barbecue sauce, I could till, still taste the dang Italian dressing. <laughs> because the barbecue sauce was on the outside, but the Italian dressing went on the inside. If you do not marinate yourself in the Word of God, you are marinating yourself in the Word of the world. It is impossible to stay unmarinated. And it is impossible to maintain your faith. You are either growing closer to God or growing further away. I'm not, I'm not trying to be difficult. I'm not. I don't want you to come here and feel like, well, that's great. He made me. What did I make you do? Read the Bible? What a horrible person. I mean, for God's sakes, it's just a fellowship. <laughs> you know? I mean, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, what's so big deal about the Word? It's everything. You wouldn't know how to pray. You wouldn't know how to relate to God. You won't know about the end. You won't know how to repent. You won't know anything without the Word of God. It is paramount. It is crucial. I just, I can't stress it enough. I just can't. And for the life of me, I know people are wasting time on the Internet. I know they're wasting time looking at YouTube. Should you read the Word of God all the time? Look, I know that's not possible. I know that's not possible. And, and I understand somebody sends you a picture of a baby, you know, a video of a baby farting and it's getting 100 million views and you feel the need to send it to your friend because Lord knows that's something to watch. Knock yourself out. I could care less. It doesn't mean you're secular, you're not a faithful person or you don't love God. Don't, don't get me wrong. I get it. You got to watch something stupid every now and then. But some of you are marinating in that stupid. To spending way too much time with it. I mean, that's crazy when you got the Word of God right in front of you. One day they might take it away from you. So if it's not in you, what are you going to do then? The Talmud says that when Jacob was about to reveal the end of his days to his children, when he was coming close to his death, his concern was that one of them might be a non-believer. Any parents know what I'm talking about? Yes, we all do who love the Lord. Yes, 
That's, 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 that's our objective, that we should have kids that love the Lord. So his sons reassured him immediately. He said, are oh, you guys believers? And they, and they, you know what they did? They started singing the Shema. Think about it. And I, I can relate. I can really relate because in 2005, and it looked lights out, and the doctor came in and said, tell your wife to bring the kids in. And I was all hooked up and looked like I was dying. You know? Lily was only five months, so she was, you know, she didn't know what was going on. The other two ran in the corner and cried and then ran out of the room because they saw me the way I was. They were five and, and four. And then, but Jeremy, Jeremy could understand some things. He was, I think, 10, right? 11, 10, close to 11. He was going to be 11. So I sat him on my bed and I said, there's a good shot. I'm not going to make it, kid. But I need to know. I won't be able to go unless you tell me that you're not going to blame God. Jerry, I know where I'm going. I don't question God. I don't deserve to live any longer than I am. But I know where I'm going because of my faith. And you have to believe that. And I can't go unless you tell me that you'll still trust the Lord. And you won't lose your faith. That was all that mattered to me. It's still all that matters to me. Now, some of you might not have raised your kids in the way they should go. Some of you did. And it might not have worked out or it might not be working out. Be careful not to blame yourself too much. Nobody's a perfect parent. Nobody does it right all the time. And sometimes we have these bumps in the road. But I'm here to tell you, if you've done it with your heart the best you can, in the end they won't depart. I'm sure of it. I'm sure of it. You'll be like, no, I can't. It, they're so far away. So was I. And look what I'm doing. Last but not least, Deuteronomy 6, 7. And you ought to teach. See, it's, it's not good enough to study. You ought to teach. Yes. Hebrews says, by now you should be teachers. If you have no kids, you should have spiritual kids. Amen. Every single one of you should be a teacher in one way, shape, or form. Yes. You can't. These guys stood under Yeshua for three years, and they were master teachers. Some of us are believers for 30 years. Amen. We should all be teaching. And you ought to teach them carefully to your children. Be very diligent. Be very steadfast. Be very serious about it. You want to talk about them when you sit at home. You see the opposite, sitting, walking, lying, getting up, all inclusive. I believe the children are our future. Teach them well and no. Let me tell you the best way to teach your kids. And I'm, this is just my experience and my opinion and what I see as, as a pastor of people all over the world. The best way to teach your children is to walk it out yourself. Yes, words will not cut it. They will laugh and goof at your words. Amen. You could sit there and talk to them all day long about it. It won't mean anything unless you walk it out. And be authentic. Yes. When you mess up, fess up, pal. Yes. Fess up and do it quick. Apologize. Teach them how to apologize. Teach them how to release forgiveness to you. When they say it's okay, say, no, look at me in the eye. I feel horrible about what I said. Please, please, please release me and forgive me because they're going to have to learn how to do it. It's crucial. Crucial, crucial, crucial. Be authentic. So what is Judaism or who is a Jew? The word Jew is Yehudi, and it comes from a root word, Yehuda, and it means to be a praiser. I'll tell you how you praise God. One who loves God, one who learns his word, and one who teaches his children. Look, this is Judaism's credo. Love, learn, teach. Love, learn, teach. And I got news for you. I think it should be the Christian's credo as well. God has not changed. We're almost ready to split. In, in the observant Jewish mindset, we believe, and I'm an observant Jew, we believe that the Torah didn't show up on Sinai, that it was before the creation of the world. Why? Because the Torah is God's heart. I mean, if Yeshua was married, do you think he'd commit adultery? Would he covet? Would he not take care of the poor, the one, the orphan? It's the heart of God. It's the word. It's the heart of God. The word was with God. 
And there's an old legend, a Talmudic legend. It's a legend. There's, there's no proof to it, but I just, I just like it. I just like it. It appears that God was trying to extend his Torah to different peoples, whether it's the Hivites or the Parasites. When they asked about them, <laughs> nobody wanted them. Because they said, what, 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 what is it like? And when they said, well, thou shalt not steal, but they weren't interested. And when he came upon the children of Israel, the Hebrews, they did want it. And he said, why should I give it to you? And they said, we'll obey it. And he thought, I mean, even Moses declared, and when you are scattered to the nations, because of disobedience, God said, that's, that's not going to work. He said, I, I want you to think about it. And we'll come together tomorrow, and we'll discuss it. And so God returns, and he asked the people, so why should I give it to you? And they said, we'll teach it to our children. And then he extended the Torah. It is crucial that we teach. Yes. Crucial that we teach. Yes. You don't need a testimony that says, well, I was in prison, I was on crack, and then I met the Lord. It's, hey, hallelujah, because... Yeshua saves, right? But I like boring testimonies that go, oh, I just love the Lord most of my life, and that's about my testimony. That's the one I want for mine. You know what I mean? I mean, God is good, but I like boring testimonies better. You know what I'm saying? Next week, we're going to delve into it. We're going to break down the words, every single solitary word in there going to figure out what is one. Is it a plurality? Is it not plurality? Is it one in number? One in power? We're going to break it down. We're going to break it down. And then we're going to get into what Yeshua taught. And I think you're going to see that what he taught and what Deuteronomy tells us is the same because he was the word. He was the word. And when a scribe would come to him, an expert in the Torah, isn't it crazy that the expert in Torah was talking to the one who wrote the Torah? Let's stand together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Um, who's from Germany? Don't we have somebody from Germany here? You guys are from, um, you're in Ramstein, right? And you're, you're with the Hodges, right? How long do you know Michael? He's a very special guy. Yeah, they're very, very special. Really special. I love him dearly. He might be coming back in about a year, maybe. And so your husband is stationed there at Ramstein? Yes. And you're here in the States right now just visiting? Mm -hmm. He's got some work to do? Mm -hmm. And you're here in Georgia? Right. Beautiful. You are in Georgia? <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say it like that. <laughs> I didn't mean it like that. Did it come off like that? Did it? Okay. Let me try it again. Oh, Georgia. <laughs> Anywhere in particular? Uh-huh. What about that old miss? No. <laughs> supposed to be the Harvard of the South, right? Is that what they say? Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's a lot of great schools here, right? Mercer. Mercer, yeah. Yeah. Yikes. <laughs> well, that's good. It's nice to meet you. I just wanted to say hello because I heard you were going to be here. Little birdie told me. So, so how long are you staying in Georgia? Wow, and then you're heading back to Ramstein. All right. A good and tag. Grüß Gott. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you his peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Shalom. Shabbat shalom, guys. <laughs>